Let's continue talking about the uh, structural levels in narrative. Um, now, what might, what might I mean by a structural level? You know, again, when you look at narrative literature, there's different, uh, we're really getting into linguistics here and things like that, but there's different levels. For example, you have structural, uh, verbal structural markers. Things like repeated words, metaphors, similes, grammar, syntax. At the verbal level, you have things that tells you what's going on, whether it's the introduction, whether it's the conclusion, whether it's an intermediate scene, you have those. Uh, and the structure can be developed through narrative technique, the things that we've talked about already, the repetition and those kinds of things. You can develop that way. Uh, you can also develop the structure through what we would call the narrative world. Um, the characters and the events and the history and all that kind of stuff. In other words, the structure can be built around the story and its players. Uh, those are things to notice. Uh, but you can also develop structure in narrative literature through concepts. There can be a conceptual content where you focus on themes and ideas. The Gospel of John, for example, is really structured more around themes than anything else. Although, of the four Gospels, it has the most chronological markers in it. It's based on the Gospel of John that we know that Jesus had a three and a half year ministry. If we didn't have the Gospel of John, we might have thought he only ministered for a year and a half or so. But John tells us which feasts he was at. And so we know he attended, uh, I think it's the Passover, or one of them, at least three times. We know that. So um, you can have those things. But John does a lot of development through ideas. And sections cover certain concepts and ideas. Uh, so uh, when we're looking at the conceptual content, we're looking for, for themes that... Uh, put together the central idea. We're also looking for ideas that will point, point us to the message or the lesson or the point being made, the teaching found in the narrative. Uh, and, and sometimes they are more conceptual than they are repeated words or repeated phrases or an inclusion or, or one of those other literary devices that we've already talked about. So we look for these levels in narrative literature as well to get the real, again, the point the author's making. And we see these are the key things that are showing up. And this guides me then in coming to the point of the author. And uh, if we miss the point of the author, we've had a fun story, but we've missed the whole point. You know, I find it, 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 it interesting that uh, people are guilty of that, let's say, with the Narnia Chronicles. There's a purpose behind the Narnia Chronicles. It's evangelistic. A person can read it and have a great time and miss the whole point of the Narnia Chronicles. Now, interestingly enough, if you pay close attention to the different literary devices, things that are said and done, you discover the theology behind the Narnia Chronicles. What you may not know is that C.S. Lewis believed a person could lose their salvation. And in the seventh book, one of the people in the group does. One of the characters doesn't go to heaven because they no longer believe in Aslan. Now, he believed that that's the only way that you could lose your salvation was to stop believing in Christ. But that's a part of his theology. He also believed that you could go to heaven without believing in Jesus. That if you were just moving in the right direction. And he has a Sarasan soldier who worships their God, but he's got the right heart attitude, but he doesn't know the truth, but he ends up going on to heaven. Because that was a part of C.S. Lewis's theology. Now, when my son reads the book, he's never picked up on that theology. It's just an interesting story. And this guy ran through the door along with everybody else. But it's a significant thing. When you know what things to look for. And in the Narnia Chronicles, there are some very important statements made about the character and work of God. You know, like they ask the animals, is Aslan tame? Is he safe? And they said, he's safe, but he's not tame. And he's really talking about our God. 
when he's describing Aslan. And I love the description because, you know, often we think of God as a sugar daddy. He's preached that way. But our God, though in his arms we're perfectly safe, in rebellion we find he's not tame. See? Uh, he's very dangerous. Our God is a very dangerous God to mess with, even as his children. Uh, and the, the, the scriptures teach very clearly that if you want to play games with God, you better watch out. Uh, and so, but you see this in the use of different narrative techniques and, and the words that come out of people's mouths and things like that, which we can talk about. So you pay attention to those. Okay, let's, one last thing I, I'd like to talk about in this area in terms of narrative literature is historical considerations. Um, we need to have a historian's concern in that it does matter that narrative literature is historical. But again, I want to make it real clear that one of the mistakes made by many theologians uh, and, and students of Scripture is they try to impose our modern standards of historiography on the biblical text. And the problem is this, is... Again, it's not trying to be the supposed neutral view that our modern standard of historiography operates off of. Uh, it is intentionally communicating a divine perspective. But one very important thing to recognize is that it is still historically accurate. Now, you say, well, we don't do that, do we? Oh, yeah. We write American history from an American perspective. In fact, we write about the discovery of America from a European perspective. In fact, most of our history is from a European perspective. That's why we discovered China. Well, just a minute. The Chinese were there discovering themselves for thousands of years. They were a civilization a elaborate civilization, a highly advanced civilization, when Europe was wallowing around in the Dark Ages trying to climb out of a cave. So, we discovered them. It's an arrogance, in a sense, but it's a historical perspective. Yes, it's true, Europe was unaware of China until Marco Polo went over and learned about uh, Chinese cooking and brought it back and the Italians ended up with spaghetti and ravioli. Those are both Chinese dishes that have been modified, that were brought back by him. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, you have this, but history is still very real. Now, how important is history? History is very important to narrative literature. Uh, the, the theology, the truth of its teaching depends on the historical truth of what happened. If it's just fiction, and here's the key, if it's just fiction, then it becomes what a lot of liberal theologians say it is, which is good moral instruction. See, a lot of them view it as fiction, so what they see it as is a good expression of religious experience by the author, but it does not carry the weight of truth, or thus saith the Lord. Because it's not really true. So it would be like reading the Narnia Chronicles, that you know it's fiction, but it has good moral lessons to teach. But I would not go and and have the Narnia Chronicles read in a history course. For that matter, would I have missioners' books as a history class? Well, no, because the characters are fictional. And everybody knows they're fictional. Well, the same thing. So, so the, the historical issue in narrative literature is if it's not historically accurate, it becomes just a fable, just fiction of no more value 
than any other, you know, than the Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, and it's 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 good it's good reading it's good literature but it's not something that carries the weight of thus saith the Lord or something that I must interact with and that's why so many of these theologians fight the historicity of the Bible that's why when Catherine Kenyon excavated Jericho she did not report the discovery of the walls lying flat and of the food still in the jars having been burned. That matched the description of the Bible at the destruction level that would have matched the time of Joshua's invasion. Why didn't she report it? Because she did not want the Old Testament to be true. That's why you have minimalist archaeologists right now. That when they find an inscription that makes a reference to the house of David... They try every way possible to interpret that, to translate it to something else. Because they do not want to admit that David existed. David, as far as they're concerned, is another King Arthur. You know, but of course now we're beginning to, some historians are beginning to say, well, you know, there probably was a King Arthur back then. He wasn't the one with the round table. It wasn't as glorious. He was probably, again, some, some uh, near caveman, medieval you know, local warlord uh, who uh, uh, picked his nose and had rotten teeth. You know, but uh, he did exist and he, and he probably won a couple of good sword fights. And from this the myth developed. Uh, and he had some knights and they may have even had a table that was round. Who knows? You know, it goes way back. So they want to make David that because as soon as you admit that Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles are real history, you have to admit that there's a God behind that history. And then you become accountable to that God. And they don't want to have that happen. Uh, and so they make it something nice. So now, the issue then is truth and meaning. If it's historical, it not only becomes true, but it becomes meaningful. Because now we've seen the hand of God. And we've heard the voice of God. And we've seen his dealings with his people. If it's fictional, it's just a good story. Used to convey some religious experience. Some religious truth that's generated from within the writer. But if it's historical, it's not. Okay. Now, one difference between modern historiography and biblical historiography is the Bible interprets the history from a divine perspective. In other words, it tells you what happened and it tells you why it happened from a divine perspective. Modern historiography doesn't do that. It'll tell you what happened and it'll tell you, maybe it'll try to tell you why it happened from a sociological perspective but not from a divine perspective. And that's the difference. Okay, that's the difference between the two. Does that make sense? Any questions on this area? You know, that's one of the reasons why our biblical text records failures. You go to all the ancient writings about kings, you never hear about their failures. I like to point out there was one battle between the Assyrians and the Egyptians where both armies were reduced down to about 10%. I mean, they just wiped each other out. They were both so badly beaten, they both had to go back home and just give up on the war. They both claimed a magnificent victory in their writings. And talked about how they slaughtered all these enemies. But they both failed to mention the fact that it took them 20 years to recover from the battle. That's typical ancient world. That's typical ancient world. Not so the Bible. You got all the warts showing. They don't hide David's sin, even though he's considered their greatest king. They don't hide Solomon's sin uh, and all that. So it's a very different thing. It's a very different thing. 
Well, let's switch gears and go into some Bible study methods things. And let's talk about uh, textual arrangement. But first of all, let's see uh, how things went with your observations. Okay, let's uh, do some observations here, see what observations you got here. And we'll have some fun. And how did y'all find it? Challenging? Easy to get 25, right? I mean, I should have just given you half a verse. That would give you more of a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and so, what are some of the things that you observed from the passage? At the beginning of the passage, too, uh, I observed that, you, that we should walk in Him. And that was further brought out in Ephesians 5, 2 and 8, and Colossians 4 and 5, that we should actually walk in Christ. Okay, so now the observation, you're leaning towards an interpretation there. So the ob here's an ob observation. You said we should, okay? So that you know, would you describe it as a command? Is yeah. it a command or a statement? Yeah, command. command. Yeah, Very command. Good. See, that's, that's a key thing to note there. Good. What else? Some other observations. See, and you're, you're, you're noting of this same concept in other verses. That's a good observation of its a relationship to other passages. Uh, you, you, you noted parallel, parallel passages, maybe, would be a, a way to say it. Right? Match some other places that says the same thing. Huh? The uh, passage starts with the connective. Ah, okay. And what is that connective? Um, therefore, or as. Okay, therefore. Yeah, it begins with the word therefore. That's an important observation. Now, an interpretive question that you would ask from this is, why does it begin with that word? See, that would be one of your interpretive questions. Okay? What else can we observe? Talks about being rooted. I, I, I put, uh, you know, to grow like an oak, okay, and all that that connotates. Uh, exercise your faith, and just like faith. you would. There again, you're interpreting. You're interpreting. <laughs> but uses rooted, okay. He uses the word rooted, so that leads to the question. You know, is it? You know, what is it? What does it symbolize? And you might observe here that rooted is figurative, right? Right. It's also passive. It's passive, good. Or at least it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, uh huh. Having been rooted. Try having been rooted, uh huh. I thought it was strange that it says rooted and then. Built, rooted and yes. It's like a plant, yeah. so it's something when you're growing a plant, ah, something yeah. is made. And I, That's right. I you notice rooted and built are together, okay? And you know this is a plant, and this is a thing, like a building. So it goes on to say established. So yeah, established. established. Yeah, you got the term established. 
that's related to these two. And an observation is rooted, built, and established are somehow related to each other. So that's an observation. You haven't said how they are. That's the question you ask. How are they related? And the question you might ask is, why did he use these two images? What about each image is important? That would be an interpretive question. Because he used them because there's a difference between the two. For example, rooting goes down, building goes up. Maybe there's some significance there. See? Uh, and that's something I observe, but I haven't answered the question yet. But it leads to more and more questions. Good observations leads to multiple questions. And it's not unusual to have five or ten questions grow out of a single observation. And that's a good thing. <coughs> Some of them you'll never answer. Out of those five or ten questions, you'll decide these two or these three I need to answer. These are the ones I want to research and find the answers to. Um, what other key words do we have? Learn. Learn. Good. So you're going to ask the question, what does that mean? How is it used here? Gratefulness. Thankfulness. Thankfulness. Another key term. Let's ask this question. Can you identify any figures of speech? Significance of that. Uh, 
basic principles of the world. Um, when it says principles of the world, there's a figure of speech. What does of the world mean? Is he talking about the planet? Is he talking about the world system? See, that's figurative language. Um, so the idea of dwelling, in him dwells all the fullness. What does it mean by dwells there? That's a figure of, that, that, again, that's a figure of speech. That's figurative language. Uh, who is head of all principality and power. Head is a figurative term. See, there are a lot of figurative elements in here that you would want to take note of. A lot of key words. A lot of twists and turns there. Uh, notice verse, verse 9 in mind begins with four. Four in young dwells. You observe it, that becomes a significant observation. And just note, this verse begins with the word for. The question I'm going to ask is why? Well, it, you know, later on you decide the reason it begins with for is because verse 9 is explaining verse 8. It's an explanation of something. So what is it explaining in verse 8? That's the next question that comes from that. And how does it explain what he said in verse 8? What aspect of verse 8 does it, does it explain? Now, Paul is, is really great about that. I've seen sometimes where he's got a, 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 a paragraph that every sentence begins with four, except the first one. And it turns out that the whole paragraph is explaining the very first statement. And everything is an expl explanation of something he said in the previous statement. So he explains his first statement, but then there's something in the second statement, or in the explanation that needs to be explained. So he explains that, but then there's something in that explanation that needs to be explained. So he explains that. So you go all the way through these fours, then you have to work your way back up. To get the point that was being made. But that's something to observe. And these are the kind of things. In, in, remember, in observation, all you're doing is seeing the what. What's there? What is it that I need to look at? What questions does this bring to my mind? And then you ask those interpretive questions. And this is going to give you the things to research. And the kind of things you're observing is the structural markers, the, the syntax, the words, key words, and the things you're going to then investigate are the meanings and the significance of these things. And the real goal is this. You're studying it so that when, when, I, when I study a passage, I research these things with the idea that when I finally decide this is what Paul meant to say by this, I'll also know, and here are the four or five or six key things that if you understand it the same way I understand it, you'll see the verse the same way I see it. If you don't, if you see those things differently, you'll interpret it differently. But if you understand these things the same way I do, you'll end up where I'm at in terms of the meaning. You'll recognize the meaning. And then when you go to teach it, those become the things you emphasize in your explanation of the passage. And after you've explained those things, if you pick the right ones, just about everybody sitting there listening to you will go, of course that's what it means. And they'll be able to remember it later on. And they'll later on go back and say, yeah, and, you know, let me show you why this passage means this thing. You know, these are the things in it. Uh, and so that's the key. And it, it all begins with good observations. Just like we talked, it all begins with good observations. Any questions on that? This was just a, sort of a, a first shot at it, getting a good feel. Well, go ahead and turn in your present observation. Hopefully you've kept a copy on your computers and all that kind of stuff. And continue to make observations. And uh, that would be great. Thank you, thank you. Well, let's talk about one of the things that we would observe, uh, and something to observe, but also something that helps guide the meaning of the text, and that's what we call textual arrangement. Textual arrangement. What is textual arrangement? Well, the Bible was written to be read out loud. As a result, it was written in units of thought we call paragraphs. 
not verses. The original Bible did not have any verses. The verses got added. Uh, I, you know, I think probably what happened, I forget the name of the monk that got given the job, but the monk was given the job to put verses in the Bible. Obviously, he had too much time on his hands. And his uh, abbot decided to keep him busy. It's sort of like when I was in the Army, I was in an engineering agency uh, uh, doing, doing supposed engineering analysis, and uh, uh, they didn't have enough work for me because I had no engineering background. The Army had assigned me there because they needed somebody there, and I was available, so they stuck me in the slot. So I had a cubicle, and uh, my primary activity in many days was to uh, make paper wads and play artillery, i.e. bomb the guys who were actually trying to get work done. <laughs> so they decided then to uh, send me off to school, first of all and then to keep me busy by having me write an article. So I got to write an article about what they did. Uh, and it kept me out of trouble for several weeks. So I think that's what they did to the monk. You know, I've got to keep this guy busy. He's, a, he's a short everybody. Let's just have him pick up the phone. I don't know how the story goes. But they did assign the job, and he came up with it. But originally, there wasn't verses. There was just paragraphs. So the real unit of thought as I understand it in the, in, in, in the Bible, is the paragraph, not the verse. So when you, when you study, you should always study units of thought, not individual verses. And don't be locked into the chapter and verse divisions because he made a few mistakes as he went along. We now know that. There's some places where it would have been nice if he'd have, if he'd have made the verse break three words later, or the paragraph break, or the chapter break one one paragraph later, or one paragraph sooner, or one verse sooner, or something like that. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, don't feel locked into the chapters and verses in your Bible. Uh, look at the thought flow. Now, to understand the authors, we need to hear them speak through their writings. Because they wrote, they wrote with the idea that somebody would read this publicly and other people would hear it. That's why John says in Revelation, blessed is the one who reads and the one who hears the words of this prophecy. That's what's going on. Because that's what, because people they couldn't afford books or scrolls at that time. Um, so, this involves, though, recognizing what's going on literarily. Because they wrote in such a way that their listeners could follow what was happening literarily. Okay? And, uh, and to do this, we pay attention to the rules the authors follow in communicating ideas. These rules affect how sentences and ideas are, are organized, and this is what we call the arrangement of the text. How did he organize his thoughts? How did he arrange it to get an idea across? Okay. The arrangement and ordering of the text helps us see the unity of the text by seeing the organization of the ideas within the text. Uh, this has been very helpful because... In the past, many biblical scholars viewed the text of the Bible more as a manual than as a piece of literature. And so they had a tendency to do what we've talked about uh, called proof texting, where you just simply take a verse out of its context and it proves my point. Well, now that we recognize that, no, these are literary pieces that when Paul wrote his epistle, he followed all the rules of a normal epistle. When, uh, when, when Luke wrote Luke and Acts, he was following the literary conventions of his day. And he's actually following the pattern of literature that we have in extra-biblical writers. So, same thing. So, we, 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 we begin to look at these, and we look at the arrangement of their ideas, and we're looking primarily for relationships when we talk about the arrangement of the text. This may involve something as small as a sentence, or as large as a chapter. Uh, or maybe in the whole book of the Bible, like in uh, what we think of as books like in the Pentateuch. You've got five major movements in this one document called the Pentateuch. Genesis is not a book by itself. It's a chapter in the book of Moses and the law. Now, as, as an example of what we mean by arrangement of, 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 of the text, Matthew chapter 1 as a family tree arrangement. We call it a genealogical list. It's arranged 
in that style, that type. So and so begets so and so who begets so and so who begets so and so. In John 1, you have a theological arrangement and a thematic arrangement where he introduces themes. And uh, uh, there are different ways that the text gets arranged to achieve, to achieve different purposes. Okay, so let's talk about some of these. Uh, the first kind of arrangement that is done is comparisons. And again, this is whether it's in narrative literature, epistolary literature, any of the literature now, uh, you can find comparisons. And a comparison is when you're associating similar thoughts or ideas. You're looking at the similarities. For example, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, is an Adam-Christ comparison on the importance of the Incarnation. Okay, Jesus and Christ are being, I mean not Jesus Christ, Adam and Christ are being compared to one another. In Hebrews chapter 5, you have two high priests who get compared. One of them is Christ, and the other is Melchizedek. And he goes through and shows the similarities between the two. Okay. So, often a text will be arranged around showing you what's the same, what's similar between them. Comparison. Another form of textual arrangement is the contrast. Ah, you probably suspected I was going to go to that next. Yeah. Just as you have comparisons, you can have contrasts. For example, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, light and darkness are contrasted. Walking in the light, walking in the darkness. Who does it? Well, we cannot walk in darkness and still have fellowship with God. But really, the contrast is between two spheres in which a Christian lives. And it's not two spheres of the light, saved and lost, the light and the dead, but two spheres of a believer's experience, dark and light. And that sphere is defined further in 1 John chapter 1 and 2 as the moral sphere of God. So light is moral purity. Darkness is sin. It's defined further as walking in the light is a byproduct of loving one brother or sister in Christ. If you don't love your brother or sister in Christ, you're walking in darkness. Later on, he defines that as loving them or murdering them. He uses these contrasts throughout 1 John as a literary device, as a part of the structure. This versus this, this versus this. So you can, again, have comparisons within the structure, you know, arranged around comparing the two, uh, or you can have it arranged around contrasting two things. So that's, you see what I'm talking about there. And so, whenever you're looking for how is the text arranged, you pay attention to those kinds of things. Now, another, another way texts can be arranged is around what's called interchange. And that's where you alternate two or more elements. You go back and forth, you interchange between the two. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it can be ideas. It can be people. It can be actions. Okay, think about this. Luke chapters 1 and 2. What's going on in Luke chapters 1 and 2? See if you remember your Gospels here. It's the birth narrative. Two people get born in Luke chapters 1 and 2. John the Baptist and Jesus. And in Luke 1 and 2, you go with, first it's John the Baptist's parents, then Jesus' parents. And John the Baptist's birth, then Jesus' birth. It goes back and forth, back and forth between the two. And that's this interchange. He could have told all of John the Baptist's story and then told all of Jesus' story. But he chose to go back and forth between the two because he's connecting the two to each other. 
And he's showing you not just what happened in each of their births, which were both supernatural births in some way. Jesus is, of course, far more supernatural than John's. But also they're connected to each other. John is his forerunner. He's a part of what God is doing. He's as integral to Jesus' ministry as Jesus is. And so he brings that out. Um, uh, another good interchange occurs in the Gospels where you have, uh, uh, in, uh, and I think it's the Gospel of John, where you have Peter's denials of Jesus alternating with Jesus' confession before the Sanhedrin. So there's a real contrast between Jesus standing there and saying, I am the Messiah, and standing up to all the fear and, and, and harassment and intimidation, and not being intimidated, and then you got Peter crumbling. And it goes back with other Gospels, it just does the whole Peter thing all at once, all three denials, bing, 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 we're done. But in that one, it goes back and forth between Peter and, and Jesus, Peter and Jesus, Peter and Jesus. And so, by doing this, you had that classic interchange. One of the best examples of interchange is the book of Job. And Job's three friends. So, you know, you begin with Job lamenting, saying, Oh, I'm so miserable, I wish I was dead. And then the first friend says, Well, Job, you know, if you just confess your sin. And then Job responds says, I didn't sin. The next guy says, Well, if you just confess your sin. And Job responds says, I didn't sin. And the third guy says, well, if you just confess your sin, and he goes, I didn't sin. And then the next one says, well, let me list your sins. You know, and then Job, Job says, I'm not guilty of them. And the next one says, well, let me list your sins. And you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, over and over and over and over and over. And it's just driving home one point. And that is that they thought he was guilty, that they thought because he was suffering, he had to have done something wrong. And Job looked at his life and said, I know that I've lived righteously. But I have no clue as to why it's gone wrong. So you got this interchange back and forth and back and forth used in this wisdom literature to really drive home the struggle, the question, why do the good people, why do the righteous suffer? And of course the point of Job we learned from the first two chapters in the last comments is because of God's purposes and we're not made privy to them. But, but the interchange is a key rhetorical device that helps us see the message of the book. It's in that interchange and the repetition of Job's innocence and their accusations that you begin to see their understanding of reality and Job's understanding of reality. And you see when God then in the end says, Job was right and y'all were wrong, and either you bring a sacrifice through Job or I'm going to get you. You realize all these things they said about God weren't true. And some of them sound pretty good. But it was the wrong perspective. So that, that, that's what interchange does. Another, uh, another key thing is unity through continuity. Continuity. And this is where you begin, you develop the unity of a passage or a thing through the succession of restated elements, events, or thoughts. There's something that connects them all together that gets restated. That, that you can see they're all interconnected because this idea or this term or whatever. For example, Luke chapter 15. We have the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. These are connected. They're all one unit of thought. But there's three parables in them. Now the first two parables end with the same rejoicing and the same description of God's attitude. That's the real point. The third parable has the father demonstrating this attitude, but the eldest brother not. See? But you've got the continuity so that you see that the third parable is saying exactly the same thing as the first two parables. Why does that become significant? Because in the, in the debate between MacArthur and, and Zane Hodges, they both go to the parable of lost sheep to try to argue for their position on whether or not uh, repentance is necessary for, for one's salvation. And where works fits in. And all this kind of stuff. And they build all these arguments around whether or not the, uh, the prodigal son was saved or not. MacArthur says he got saved because he, he submitted to the lordship of his father. 
Megadra and, 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 and Hodges says no, but he got back in fellowship with his father. Well, the whole real point of the parable has absolutely nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with what is my attitude towards someone who wants to get saved? The whole point of the passage is not was the prodigal son saved or not? And the whole point of the passage was not how does someone get justified? The whole point of the passage is what is supposed to be our attitude towards people who want to get right with God? And we're supposed to rejoice and not be grumpy about it. And mad about it. That's the whole point of the, of the parables. But you see that by the connection to the first two parables. And continuity ties them together. 1 Corinthians 13. What ties 1 Corinthians 13 together? Love. Love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love, 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 love. And the greatest of these is love. It begins with, if I don't have love, this is the greatest. Love, 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 love. Yeah, the word love connects that chapter as a unit of thought. And it's an important element there. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, verses 24, 26, and 28, the last part of Romans, three times says, God gave them over. Very significant. Those are connected. And so you see that the three judgments are all part and parcel of the same rejection of God's revelation. They rejected God's revelation. He gave them over to sexual immorality. They continued to reject. He gave them over to homosexuality. They continued to reject. He gave them over to perversion. See, And so you have this repeated, God gave them over. And uh, that produces continuity, and that connects those things together. And you see the flow of thought. It smooths the flow of thought, and you see how they're interrelated to each other. Jonah has a couple of things that produce continuity. Chapter 1 and chapter 3 begins with the command, Rise and go to Nineveh, that great city. In chapter 4, Verses 4 and 9. Twice God asked the same question. Job, do you have a right to be angry? <laughs> See, it's pulling that chapter together. Uh, and, it's, and, it, and it's showing you how all the things there really are the same point being made. Uh, and so it connects things. And it shows. You know, and... and, and, and in Job, you not only have the continuity, but you have the contrast in Job's responses. You have the similarity in God's commands. You have all these other devices being worked out in Job. Job is phenomenally great literature. In fact, some people question its historicity because it's such well-written satire. But a person can be satirical about themselves. And again, Jesus thought Jonah was historical. And if Jesus thinks Jonah happened the way it says it happened, I believe him. And so, but you do have these literary devices that Jonah used to communicate the ideas. And the whole point is God's interaction with Jonah. Jonah, do you have a right to be angry? And it's really a rebuke is what it comes down to. And the whole point of the book of Jonah is Jonah needed to get it. And he finally did. And that is that God cares about lost people even if they are your enemy. Well, another, another textual arrangement Another thing to look for is cause and effect. Cause and effect. Okay, cause and effect is a connection of thought or an event to its resulting conclusion. And this is a very common element. Here's this happens, this is what results. Cause and effect. Cause and effect, a very important one. Now, you may go from cause to effect or from effect to cause. It can go either way. For example, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 goes from cause to effect. Having been justified, cause, we have peace with God. Effect. See? Cause and effect. Joshua 7 and 8. You go from cause to effect twice. Achan's sin leads to 
defeat. They punish the sin, purge it from their midst, leads to victory. One of the main themes of the book of Joshua is if Israel will obey God, they'll win. Blessing comes through obedience. Cursing comes through disobedience in accordance with the Mosaic Law. And here's a good example. Achan's sin. We can't even beat a teeny tiny little town called I. Now we can, when we're obedient, we can take a fortified city like Jericho. But when we're disobedient, we can't even beat a little fortress outpost. See, that's the whole point. But when we get back right with God, we'll clean them out. Clean their clocks. Um, and so, he uses this cause and effect relationship. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, is an interesting passage. Tell me how he's doing it here. And he made, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Okay? We were dead. And here's the reason why. Notice he moves from effect to cause. The effect is I'm dead in trespasses and sins. What caused me to be dead in trespasses and sins? I walked according to the course of this world. I walked according to the prince of the power of the air. I once conducted myself in the lust of my flesh. And that's what caused me to be dead in trespasses and sins. So the cause is at the end, the effect is at the beginning. So you can move from effect to cause, just as you can go from cause to effect. That makes sense there? And so, again, they go in both directions. The authors purposely go both directions on that, and you pay attention to those kinds of things. Okay? Another uh, structural marker is progression. Progression. And what I mean by that is this is where thoughts or events lead to a climax. This is classic literature. We have this all the time. We call it progression. Uh, a great example of progression is Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. You know, that's the passage where Paul says, Oh, you know, I want to obey God, but the harder I try, the more I sin. And, and he goes and he describes and, 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 and back and forth, and the law is good, and I am sinful, and the more I try, the worse it gets. And what does Romans 7 end with? This anguished cry. This anguished cry. Uh, you know, I don't want to say, oh, well, it's me, but that's not, that, that, that would be a fair thing. But how does he end? By saying, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? See, he reaches his climax, but all through Romans 7, you have this progression. You've got this movement that worse and worse and more and more frustrated, and, and nothing seems to work, and in fact, you know, I, I try my best and, and sin jumps up and bites me. And all it does is proves that the law is good and I'm sinful and, and oh, woe is me. And then, of course, that leads us then to, thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, that's who's going to feed me. So it brings us to the solution. But you have this anguished cry and then the exultant cry. It's my Lord. It's Jesus. There's where my deliverance is. Uh, but it's, it's this slowly building thing until this point where you just want to scream. And that's where you're using this progression. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this goes through a lot of things. You know, with David's sin with Bathsheba, it leads to that. Is he going to get away with it or not? Is he going to get away with it or not? Oop, he did it. Uh, and those things. And you can see these. Another thing to look for. Uh, 
is a thing we call cruciality. Cruciality. Now this is where a passage revolves around a crucial event. And when you hit that event, the direction changes drastically. Okay? It's like a hinge. Um, it's an event, and, and often the, uh, a key word to tell you is that then this happened. Everything's going along, ding, 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 ding. Then they went off this direction. Uh, Old Testament example. You've got, in Isaiah, chapter 1 to 35, you've got all these judgment passages. And talking about how God is going to judge Judah because of the treaties they're making. Ahaz refuses to listen. You know, the Messiah promise is made. You have all these things. And then, in chapter 40 to 66 of Isaiah... You've got all these blessing passages. How God's going to bring Judah back from Babylonian captivity. Well, the first half, first 35 chapters, Assyria is the enemy. Where's Babylon? Second half, Assyria is not mentioned, but Babylon's the bad guy. They've conquered. What's going on? Well, in between 36 through 39 is the story of Hezekiah and Sennacherib. And he trusts God with Sennacherib, and then he fails the test with Babylonian representatives. And that's the crucial turning point in the history of Judah. Up until then, Judah may have remained independent. But after that point, Judah was destined for Babylonian captivity. That was a crucial turning point in their history. And it's a crucial turning point in the book of Isaiah. Because Isaiah moves from Assyria to Babylon. He moves from judgment to blessing. He moves from destruction to restoration. And he, and he, and he moves from addressing his generation to addressing a generation 150 years later. See, everything shifts in Isaiah over that one sin of Hezekiah. And you have to understand, Hezekiah was probably the second or third most godly king Judah had. But he still looked big time. I'd say Josiah was probably the best. Then maybe David, and then maybe Hezekiah. Although Hezekiah cleaned up a lot of stuff that David ignored. But Josiah cleaned up everything. And, uh, uh, so, now, a New Testament example of this would be Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 30, Jesus has been doing a bunch of mir miracles. And in the Gospel of Mark, everything progresses up to this point. And it's all positive, positive, positive. People are happy. They're responding. His, his ministry is successful to crowds and the multitudes. And they end up on a mountaintop near Caesarea Philippi. And on the mountaintop, Jesus asked the question, Who do men say that I am? And we get the famous response by Peter, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And from this point on, verse 39, uh, 30, uh, I mean, not 39, 30, Jesus then tells them, Don't tell anybody. And by the way, now we're going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And from that point on, it's all downhill. Figuratively speaking. Opposition, opposition, tension, and he's always going towards his death. Everything's headed toward put across. So everything turned at the point where the disciples recognized who it was. That's a crucial turning point. And in Mark, that is a crucial literary turning point. Because the focus of Mark turns from who Jesus is to his coming death. And it's all focused on that. And so you have, this is called cruciality. Now, without that, the story doesn't make as much sense. And everything shifts on that. Now, by the way, each of these things will not be found in every passage. 
I've had a lot of students who found cruciality in every, in every paragraph, in every chapter, in every book of the Bible. It's not there. This is not a very common element. Again, to be cruciality, it's a major change of direction. It's a significant emotional, psychological shift. There's some major shift that goes on, and it turns on that event. Now, in the book of Jonah, there's, there's a crucial turning point. It's in Jonah chapter 2, where Jonah says, I will pay my vows. Now, what he's saying is, Lord, if you'll get me out of this fix I'm in, I'll keep my promise, and I'll go preach to Nineveh. And when he says that, the fish gets indigestion and barfs him up on beach by God's design. You know, and it's a turning point when he says, hey, I'll keep my vow. And everything happens from there. Up until then, he's continuing to digest. And uh, so, so there is that in certain places, but in other places there's not. You don't have a, for example, you don't have cruciality in the book of Jeremiah. You don't have, uh, uh, in you don't really have cruciality in the Gospel of Matthew, even though it has a turning point as in a sense, but it really doesn't because of its, of its chiastic arrangement and things like that. Now, another device in textual arrangement is the use of interrogation. Material ordered around a question. And uh, so we call it interrogation. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 15 ask the same question a couple couple times. And in you know, verse 1, he asks the question, shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? It's a rhetorical question. And he answers it with, may it never be. Make a noise up. And he goes on to explain why. So, uh, one way that a, a text can be arranged is around questions. And he asks this question, and he answers it. And he asks this logical next question, and he answers it. And so you can have those kinds of things. Uh, Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk, uh, has a series of questions that Habakkuk asks God. You got Habakkuk asks God, God answers him. Then he goes, well, okay, then well, what about this? And God says, and God answers him. And in the end, again, literary device, at the end, Habakkuk asks his last question and then says, now I'll wait on the Lord to answer me. It's a statement of trust. But there's a series of questions. You know, his first question is, Lord, why are you letting Judah get away with its sin? God says, I'm not going to let him go with its sin. I'm going to send him to you know, Babylonian. I'm going to walk on and then Habakkuk says, well, just a minute, Lord, why are you using someone more wicked than them to judge them? And God answers and says, well, because I'm going to judge them next. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'm going to get them too. Yeah, so, so you know, there's these questions. So, uh, it's, and the whole, the whole Habakkuk, the whole book of Habakkuk is built around those questions. Uh, and, uh, and so... So you, you notice the use of those. It's a, it's a strong rhetorical device. Paul uses it quite often, but it's used in other parts of the Bible as well. Uh, another major tool is summarization. Again, it's a synopsis of the material is given by the author. And sometimes when people have failed to recognize uh, this they then start saying, hey, you know, the author was obviously confused because he appears to be repeating himself. Well, no, no, that's not what's going on. For example, in Joshua 12, 1, in Joshua 12, 1, he says, now, these are the kings of the land whom the sons of Israel defeated. There's a summary saying, Israel defeated a bunch of guys. And it's followed by a summary of the conquest in which they list about 30 defeated kings in their cities. So it's a summary statement. He's already described before that, in earlier chapters, he's already described the conquest of these areas. You know, and he talked about the northern conquest and the southern conquest. And then he says, now let me give you a list of everybody they've whooped up on. Bing, 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 bing. 
Uh, and so that's, that's the use of summarization to sort of gel things together. And in the book of Joshua, after that, then it shifts to the distribution of the land. It goes from the conquest to the distribution. So he summarized his first 12 chapters and then moved on to the rest of the book. Um, another good example is Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Here the summary is first. Whereas in Joshua 12, 1, the summary was at the end of the real conquest section. Here the summary is at the beginning, where he says, you know, here's a quick record of Christ. Here's a genealogy of Christ. He announces this is his genealogy. And, and notice how he summarizes it. By, by saying, let's get there. It's not just saying, it's the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Notice what he's done. He's given them a summary, and then he begins to say, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah, and his brothers, Judah begot Perez and Zerah, uh, by Tamar, Perez begot Hezron. So he says, summary statement, this is the genealogy of Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham. Now let's begin with Abraham and work our way on down to Jesus. So it's a quick summary statement followed by the details of the genealogy. Um, and so that is uh, uh, how this is done. Let's, let's do uh, a little bit of practice on these different kinds of textual arrangement. So turn to Romans 14. And let's look at Paul's arrangement of the text and his discussion of the weaker brother. The weaker brother. Okay? So what kind of arrangements can you see in this text? Let's go ahead. I'll, I'll be reading it out loud and be looking for how the text is arranged. He says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Oops, I'm in the wrong one. I'm in 1 Corinthians to the Romans. <laughs> That doesn't sound right. Oh, okay. Weird sounding. Y'all are going, man, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Romans 14. It says, Receive the one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master you stand or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another, and others esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and rose again and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of to sell. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. If you have faith, have it, for, have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. Okay, now, what are some textual arrangements that we see in this passage? 
out of all these different things that we've talked about here, what do you spot just right off the top of your head here? Contrast. Yeah, there's a lot of contrast, right? This is a chapter built around contrast. Yeah. Right. And the contrasts need to be noted. Yeah, it's built. Not a lot of comparisons, you notice that? A lot of comparisons. A lot, huh? All of but. That's right, lots of buts. Now, he has a couple of questions in there. But is that a part of its structure? Not really. It's not built around those questions. They're rhetorical questions that, per, that carry the thought forward, but they don't develop the structure. See, So even though there's questions there, they're not a part of the textual arrangement. They're just in the text. They're, they are a rhetorical device within the text, but they're not a part of the textual arrangement. Okay? What are some other things? Repetition. Yes, good. Yeah. In fact, we'll do it this way. Repeated repetition. How's that? <laughs> yeah, lots and lots and lots of repetition. It's progression. Hmm? Progression. Progression. Good. There's some progression in there. Summarizes the whole thing in the last sentence. Yes, he uses summarization. See, in this one chapter, we have several different aspects of this textual arrangement to achieve this purpose. It's not just one thing. And, and that's why I, I picked this passage. I want you to see that. It's not, sometimes it is just one thing. But you can, you can incorporate several of these elements in a passage to achieve the purpose. And see, these are things to observe. These are observations. I recognize these are there. Now, as I go to interpret it, I begin asking the questions. What's the significance of these contrasts? Who is he contrasting? In this case, he's contrasting what? The mature Christian with the young Christian, right? Those who eat meat and those who don't. Those who do, you know, eat, uh, drink wine and those who don't. Uh, and I ask the question, what is the significance of the repetition? Notice how he repeated They do it for God, whichever one, for God. That's a significant repeated phrase there. Because he's showing both people, whichever choice you make, to eat or not eat, the real focus is on God. So the repetition of God in there is a very significant element in his argument, and it's a part of the structure of how he's put things together. And he wants you to notice that. He wants you to notice that repetition. Because it's driving home a point. Bing, bing, bing. Here's your motivation. Here's your motivation. Bing, bing, bing. And so, same thing. Progression moving right through developing this argument in the flow. And that summary statement. It's so critical. Because when he says it, it all falls into place. See, those are elements. And there are other elements in there that you can find as you continue to observe. But then you begin to ask the question, why does he do the repetition? What is the significance of it? What is the reader supposed to get from it in me? Why does he summarize it this way? Why didn't he say it some other way? You know, you begin asking those kind of interpretive questions because you see how he's arranged the text. And, uh, and so that becomes uh, a key element. A key element. That make sense? Lots of stuff to look for. See, studying the Bible is not so simple. 
We should have had this last week before we made our 25 observations. <laughs> yeah. But in fact, later on, you can go back now and, and, and you can sit there and say, I can make 250 observations now. Uh, wow. You know, there's just so much stuff to see there now that my eyes are open. The reason I have you do your observation first is because I want you to, to as you see this stuff, you can still remember what you were seeing and go, well, now, how do you keep yourself, when you start making observations about a passage, how do you keep yourself from starting to interpret them? Um, practice, experience over time. You Eventually, you, you, you begin to recognize, oh, wait, that's an interpretation. Now, often, you'll end up doing it all together. You observe and you interpret. Or you observe and you come up with an interpretive question that you know, you, you're pretty sure what the answer is, but you know this is something I need to check out. But it comes with, you have to discipline yourself to say, I'm only going to observe what's there. I'm asking the what question, I'm not, I'm, I'm not answering it. And, um, uh, but then you also, what, what, what uh, do is you, you make the observation and you make your, you know, here's one of my options as to what it means. And you begin to record what you think the options are. But you may also find that as a continued study, maybe there's another option here. Maybe there's two possible meanings. Now which one is it? That leads to interpretive questions. So, but our tendency is to go straight to interpretation. Yeah, and and it's that's the norm. That's the norm. It takes a lot of practice to break that. Uh, and what happens is when you can break that tendency, then you begin to stop and see more and more things that need to be looked at, and uh, and to be able to ask more and more questions because all these need to lead to questions that will make me dig deeper and, and help me play the devil's advocate to my interpretation. I think I know what the passage means, but what questions can I ask of myself that would really challenge my position? And those questions will come from good observations. Uh, and and What's neat is when you learn to observe these things, the interpretations do jump out at you. The meaning becomes more obvious, let's see, obvious more quickly. Uh, or more obvious more quickly. You, know, you begin to say, oh yeah, I can see the direction it's going in. And it's, it's the ability to observe these kinds of things that causes people to mistake us for having deep spiritual insight into the Word of God. And what I mean by that is because of all my training, when someone asks me a question of a passage and I open it up, that's the first thing I do. I look at these kinds of things. It's placing the context, textual connectives, which we're going to talk about next, all these different things. And then when I'm done, I just simply make observations of the passage and then from that make a quick interpretation and, and I've had people just so amazed. And all I did was said, well, you know, he used the word for there, so that must mean he's explaining this by this. And because he's explaining this by this, then this must mean this. And I go, wow. And it wasn't anything but simple. But here's the thing. I was taught how to do that by somebody. I didn't do it naturally. I didn't know how to do it until I was taught. And of course, that's what we're doing here. It's showing you the things to spot so that it will make you go deeper more quickly and to make you much more discerning as to what's in the text. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about textual connectives. And I've got a little handout for you that save you some writing here. There are different kinds of textual connectives. And what a textual connective is, is it's a word that connects stuff. And how's that for fun stuff? <laughs> and... Uh, in English, we call them conjunctions, conjunctives. And what they are are words that are primarily in sentences, but they may be leading off a paragraph or uh, a section or something like that that tells us the relationship between phrases, clauses, ideas, and it connects phrases to clauses, clauses to sentences, sentences to paragraphs, 
paragraphs to sections, and it shows us the relationship that they have to each other. And these are probably the most important words to notice when you're studying the scriptures. Especially with Paul. Especially with Paul. Uh, why is that the case? Because he builds his argument logically and he uses these words to guide him. Now here's, when we talk about different translations of the Bible, one of the best English translations for catching connectives and seeing relationships is the New American Standard. Because they are so woodenly literal that, in fact, I can look at the New American Standard and tell you what the Greek word is behind it. They're so, they're, they're so consistent. But the more literal an English translation is, the more it will reflect the very things in Greek. Now, here's the advantage of studying Greek, is if you want to study Paul, and really see these kinds of relationships, the Greek language is the best because that's what he uses. And he uses key words to guide you through logically what he's saying. And we've defined them this way. So, uh, again, the definition of a connective is that it's a word used to join other words or phrases together to make meaningful statements. And I've got nine categories here. Temporal connectives. Notice they relate words and phrases in terms of their relationship in time. Okay, so the most common ones are now, after, before, until, while, then, when. But they they connect things in time. They're very common in narrative literature. In fact, uh, with Mark, one of the connectives, temporal connectives, is immediately. Immediately this happened. Immediately this happened. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Straight away, the next thing happened. He's, he's, he's making the action go fast. You know, it, didn't, it didn't happen the next day. It happened right then. Boom. Let's go. Uh, this can be very, very significant because, for example, let me read you a passage that becomes very significant when you notice the temporal connectives. Okay, and um, listen for the temporal connectives here. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father. And he goes through all the thing. And the righteous will answer him, saying, When did we see you hungry and all that? And he'll say, Surely I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it for one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left, And depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, because of all these things that I was, and you didn't visit me. And they'll say, When did we do it? He said, When you did it. Didn't do it for the least of these, my brethren. Temporal connectives. When? When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him. Very, very important temporal connective. Then He will sit on His, on the throne of His glory. Why is that important? Because Jesus said, I will not sit on my throne until I come with all my angels. Has he come with all his angels yet? Not that we know of. <laughs> but you see, in all millennialism, they say he's sitting on his throne in heaven, reigning spiritually. But Jesus is talking to them, answering the question, when will you come back and set up your kingdom? What will be the sign of your coming back? And he says, when I come back with my angels, then I will sit on my throne and not before. Very significant words. And he, and he says, you know, again, all the nations will be gathered before him and separate them as a sheep, and he will put them then. Then he will say to those, so, you know, we've got these, this, this word, when and then, that keeps coming up. It's an important thing to notice. Uh, another temporal connected. I love to ask the question of, of students 
of the uh, two temptations, the one in Matthew and the one in Luke, which one's correct? Because Luke, it's stone the bread, jump from the temple, worship on the mountaintop. That's Matthew. In Luke, it is stone the bread, worship from the mountaintop, jump from the temple. The order is different. So which one's correct? Well, they both are. Well, they can't both have happened in the same, you know, in different orders. But the answer is Luke doesn't have temporal connectives. But Matthew does. Luke arranges it thematically. He arranges everything around the temple. Luke loves for everything to end in the temple. But Matthew, in his description, uses temporal connectives. It says, uh, you know, uh, now when the, de when the tempter came to him, he says, if you're the son of God, when he stones the bread, then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the temple pinnacle. And again the devil took him onto an exceedingly high mountain. So see, he uses temporal connectives in Matthew to tell you this is the order that the events occurred in. Whereas in Luke, he leaves those out. It's very significant, literarily. So they're both correct. Luke is not intending to give you a chronological order. But Matthew is. And the temporal connective tells you that. So that's something to notice. Now, the emphatic connective. Uh, truly, truly, indeed, indeed, barely, only. These things are, again, used to emphasize something. That's why we call them emphatic. Uh, the logical comparison shows a similarity between two words or phrases. And, also, as, likewise, so as, even so. You know, we have a bunch of these. So, one of the logical, you know, and in in, in, in when we say logical comparison, in other words, in the logic of the flow of thought, these things are used there to alert you to the fact that he's comparing these two things. And so you're supposed to notice that. Notice the comparison. That's the whole point. Um, the logical result one tells you how things develop to another cause and effect sort of thing. Uh, and uh, and key words that alert to that again is so then so then so that therefore wherefore. See, different from likewise. Uh, and so uh, we have those those uh, connections. Another another one, logical series of facts. In other words, giving you the order: first, second, third, fourth, neither nor and or uh, and sometimes they use these sometimes they just simply have like a vice list ding 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 or there's one you know then to this add this then to this add this then to this add this so you have that series of facts the 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 condition connected the if connected what if it's a subordinating connected so in 1 John he says, if we say, then this. Well, that's a subordinate clause. He begins each of his sentences with a subordinate clause, an if clause. And that's what that one is. Um, uh, the logical contrast is, again, pitting things together, focusing on the difference. But is, of course, the one we most often think of. Yet, however, neither, nevertheless, these words alert us to the fact that a contrast is being made. And we notice that. The logical reason tells us why. Since, for, because. Let me explain to you why. Uh, for is Paul's favorite one. Uh, and, uh, and of course, therefore, the logical result, another favorite one of Paul's. Uh, those are two of his favorite ones, result and reason. Let me explain to you why I'm saying this. And then there are some local connectives. It tells you the where, the in, the there, the where, and all that kind of stuff. So these are the key conjunctions used in sentences, but they also may be at the beginning of a paragraph that tells me the relationship of the paragraph to the preceding one. See? And they could be at the beginning of a sentence or inside of a sentence. But we take note of these because they tell us relationships. 
So we'll pause to take care of the camera.